I trust that uh, you had a uh, blessed Christmas. It's wonderful to see you this morning. And uh, we, uh, we probably have a lot of folk who are sick, but we pro- may have some who are still celebrating. I don't know. But, they, uh, but I know our, our young people, I think, are downstairs, and so that, uh, uh, that's always a good thing as well. Uh, if you want to turn your scriptures to Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to be there in just a moment and read one verse of scripture from uh, uh, that uh, chapter in just a second. I, uh, I know I have told some of you, maybe many of you, and maybe multiple times about a, a great uncle of mine that uh, died uh, in 1996. He was two months away from selling, uh, celebrating his 108th birthday. Now, I th- he was born in 1888, and so I think about this from time to time of all the changes that he saw come into the world during his lifetime. I mean, modes of transportation. Now, most of us, who uh, uh, we've seen him, uh, transportation improve, but we haven't seen new stuff. Like he saw automobiles come into existence and plane travel come into existence, and it's just... All the things he saw happening. Now, they say that, that as we go through the changes in this world right now, we're, they're, they're changing so quickly that we can't really appreciate them. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. But, I, but on, a, on a grand scale of things, I, I think my great uncle saw as much as anyone could ever possibly hope to see relative to change. Um, but in those years, people changed, obviously, and circumstances changed, products and ideologies and theologies and everything else. Um, and today, things are just changing with such frequency that nothing seems permanent anymore. And the thing that we thought was going to be true today for, some, uh, for, the, mo- for the bulk of our lives, tomorrow is untrue. And we've seen that especially in the last year and a half, how things have changed dramatically. And uh, as I thought about it, I jotted down a couple of phrases that meant something to me. Perhaps they will to you. The first phrase is simply this, the frequency the extremeness and the rapidity with which change is coming is staggering, uncontrollable, and disconcerting. It's just amazing how fast things change, isn't it? It's also amazing that we really can't control any of that. It, it, there's, it just happens and, and happens to us. And before you know it, things have changed. And certainly that's very disconcerting to us because the more things change, the more, more fear and anxiety we experience uh, in life because we can't get a grasp or a handle on things because uh, whatever is true today for us, somehow tomorrow seems untrue. Also, I jotted down this phrase, to trust in changes within the world and within others as a solution for our circumstances and situations will likely create anxiety and disappointment. In other words, if we're expecting other folk to change, if we're expecting situations to change so significantly and sufficiently to make our lives better, we're going to be sorely disappointed. Many of us try to change people. We try to change our spouses or our children or our parents or our friends or neighbors or whatever. If we can just change them, then my life would be fine, we're thinking. The reality is we're probably not going to change them. And if we did, we might like the end product worse than we like the one now. So we had to be pretty careful about that kind of thing. The Ecclesiastes writer said this in Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, we would like to bring that person, if it indeed was Solomon, we'd like to bring him into the 21st century and show him, wouldn't we? It's not like it was when you were here, Solomon. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about the, the, uh, the ideas of the world and the problems that we encounter and all those kinds of things that, uh, that make our lives more uh, complicated and complex. And all these things are rather cyclical. Uh, I spent this last year reading through my old college history book, about 11, 1,200 pages worth, and I started, just my jaw just dropped because I was, as I was reading a lot of the political stuff, I thought, well, that could have been written today because it was so similar. But there's one uh, entity that never changes, and that is God. God is changeless. God is changeless because, you see, change... When something changes, it implies imperfection. And since God is perfect, God does not change, nor does he have the need to. 
Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, the first part of that verse, God speaking through Malachi says, I, the Lord, do not change. He's the same God. James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We can count on God. He, he's, the, he's, he's the real deal. He, he does not change, the Bible says. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, we read an interesting, there's an interesting verse there that helps us make the connection with the, 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 the birthday that we celebrated yesterday, the birthday of Jesus Christ with God the Father, and we know Jesus to be the embodiment of God here on this earth. And the Hebrew writer says it like this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. The, the Jesus that we celebrated yesterday, the Jesus that we honored yesterday, the Jesus that, that kind of created this particular day for us to, to remember him in the sense of his coming, he's that Jesus yesterday, yes, but he's also that Jesus today. And I'm afraid there are a lot of people around the world who are celebrating yesterday who are today having all kinds of regrets and remorses, everything from how much they ate to how much they spent to, to how much they had to endure from their families or whatever the case might be. There's a lot of people that might have those kind of regrets. But there is permanency in Jesus, the Bible says, in this verse. Now, our opinions are constantly changing, but Jesus is the same today or yesterday, today and forever. Now, what that means for us is something that a lot of people don't like. Most people say they don't want change, but at the same time, they don't like repetition. I don't understand that. You can't have it both ways. I don't want change, but I don't want repetition. We understand that repetition is one of the best ways to learn, and uh, you got to have a certain amount of it. Uh, many years ago, Dr. Tom Jones, who later uh, became a uh, professor and uh, worker at Emanuel Christian Seminary, he was preaching up in the uh, Princeton, New Jersey area, and they started a, a new church work there. And uh, the way they do this, they would ma- mail out several hundred or even thousands of mailers, and the first Sunday that they were in church, first Sunday that this church gathered, like 500 people showed up. Imagine that. 500 people showed up on the first Sunday. He said after about six months into the church plant, some woman came up to him and made this statement. We sure do talk about this Jesus guy a lot. Well, guess what? There's a reason for that. You're in a church. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this Jesus guy. And repetitions about Jesus are much better than than any kind of variety we could ever ask for in all kinds of other subjects. We are here today because of Jesus. And so as we look at that verse, I want to try to answer for us the question this morning, why is Jesus the same? Why is it not, not what makes him the same, but why, does, why is it important for Jesus to be the same? I mean, it, we have it right here in print. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why is that so important? Well, let me give you, suggest some reasons for you. First of all, Jesus remains the same because sin is the same. Jesus remains the same because sin is the same. Sin still destroy, destroys the physical lives of people. How many people do you know that have died because of some kind of, uh, of, of sin that's been in their lives? They, they've they've uh, uh, participated in too much of something that's caused, them, uh, caused their death. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3, Eve was answering the serpent when she made, and she made this statement. God did say, you must not eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Physical death is coming. And much sickness in the world that we experience, I don't know if it's COVID or not, but much sickness in the world can be directly attributed to the sins of mankind. Lots of, and many of us, perhaps, and some of us anyway, sitting in this room, maybe we, maybe we got sick one time because of something we did that was not, was, would not have been approved by God. Many lives are lost because of sin. There's great, great death that comes about because of sin. We think about wars and murders and all kinds of accidents that take place because of sin, and it costs someone his or her life. And so, um, Sin, is still, sin, sin still destroys the physical lives of people. Sin also destroys the moral lives of people. People become murderers and adulterers and thieves and robbers and, and who knows what else. 
You may remember when God decided that he had seen enough of it on one occasion back in the book of Genesis chapter 6. Five, verses 5 through 7 reads as follows. The Lord saw, saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of his heart was only evil all the time. That's all people thought about was evil. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I've made them. God was sorry that he had made man because man had destroyed in a spiritual way the image God sought to to create when he formed us. And so sin still destroys the moral lives of people. That's what sin does. That's just the way it operates. That's the whole premise behind why Jesus had to come in the first place was because sin has destroyed someone's spiritual life. And that's got to be addressed in some way, the Bible tells us. So sin destroys the moral lives of people. Sin also destroys the spiritual lives of people. Many are trapped within the clutches of sin, unable to uh, extricate themselves because they don't know what to do. And the, the sad truth is that there are a lot of people around the world who have no idea they don't understand that their, 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 uh, their relationship with God is not where it needs to be. They're standing on a, on a false foundation that will not enable them to make it into eternity to spend time, spend that eternity with God. But a lot of people aren't aware of this, their own personal status relative to their sin. And as such, men are condemned throughout all eternity. Of course, Romans chapter 6, verse 22, and the first part of that verse tells us that the wages of sin is death. Now, Jesus, however, he's the same today as he was yesterday when everyone was celebrating in him and talking about this is his day. He's that Jesus today, too. And there are a lot of people that might just have liked to prefer to leave him back there yesterday when we were having a good time and not think, have to think about him today or 360 some other days during the year. But he is the same today and offers salvation to everyone who calls upon his name. So Jesus remains the same because sin is the same. The second thing we can say is Jesus remains the same because people are the same. You know, we, even though we've got all these modern things in our lives, we haven't changed a whole lot in, in, the, in the whole history of humankind. We wear different clothes, and we've learned to shave and learned to stand up straight and a few other things, but we really haven't changed all that much. Jesus remains the same because people are the same. People still experience spiritual darkness. As I referenced a moment ago, there's still that whole host of folks who are walking around on this earth not knowing that they are estranged from the Father in heaven. Even the Apostle Paul, who had surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and was the the, the greatest apostle that, uh, uh, that we have ever seen relative to what he did for the cause of the kingdom, he said about himself in Romans 7, verses 18 and 19, I know that no good thing lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not good, the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. And so there, the people are still having this experience in this spiritual weakness. And I would venture to say, we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school class this morning. I'd venture to say that many of us in this room, each and every day, have some struggles with some spiritual weaknesses of our own. Because we, we work with folks who don't always jihad with us, as we used to say. And because they don't, we we have a tendency to look at them in ways that would might, as Melvin pointed out in his uh, communion meditation, ways that would not be a godly representation, if you will, of the Christian experience. People still experience this spiritual weakness, and all of us have it, and especially those who don't know Jesus. People still need atonement for sin. And the wonderful news about all this is that Jesus is loving Jesus is forgiving, and Jesus is saving. Um, While there are a lot of folk who are trying to figure out how to navigate through this life and and balance their their good self and their bad self and uh, 
try to figure out if they can get more good stuff on one side than they have bad stuff on the other side and then squeak by and enter into the, into, enter into the, uh, to the hereafter with, a, with a, enough of a clean slate that God's going to nod and say, come on in. There's one who stands ready to wipe all that bad stuff off so we don't have to worry about that. Now, I don't know about you, but if I went to the bank and uh, borrowed money and I knew I had to pay it all back, and I'm paying on it, and it looks like I'm never going to get it paid, and the interest just keeps accruing, and it becomes obvious I'll never get it paid. And then the bank says, calls me up and says, that's all right, you don't have to pay it. Someone's taking care of it for you. You don't have to pay it at all. It would be rather foolish for me to think, well, I'm just going to keep paying on it anyway, because I just don't believe what the bank called and told me. I just don't believe the, the debt's been wiped out. And so by virtue of that, I just got to keep, keep my nose to the grindstone and keep pouring that money over there to the bank so that I, so that I can feel, feel free. And a lot of people deal with that. And, and people, as they come into the church, deal with that. I know, I know that uh, I went through this process called salvation, but I just don't know if God can forgive me of all this other. Listen, if God can forgive uh, the apostle Paul, as Paul com- confessed to, to his constituencies, he said, if, if God can forgive me because I am chief among sinners, he can forgive anyone else. Uh, you know, to, to be as great as he was, to be as magnificent as he was in terms of an ambassador for Jesus Christ, Paul, if you read his life, you realize that at one point, he was just about as bad as you could get. And Paul said, look, if... If God can do this for me, he can certainly do it for anyone else. People need, still need atonement for sin. People still need spiritual support. Uh, this was, I guess, part of the bulk of our Sunday school class discussion this morning because uh, Jesus is an empowering Savior. He doesn't leave us powerless. And when he went back to heaven, he said, I'm, I'm uh, there in John chapters 14 through 16, he tells us that what he, his plan for going back was to say to the Father, I, I want you to send them somebody that will be a helper to them. And, of course, he did that when he sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus empowers us through this Holy Spirit. He intercedes for us on our behalf. If you go back in this book of, of uh, Hebrews here that we uh, take, took our verse from, uh, in the fourth chapter, you discover that he is this great high priest that who is, was tempted in all the ways like we are, yet was without sin. And he has become our mediator, our intercessor, the one who goes before God for us. Because he is our great high priest, he ever watches over us and keeps the soul that trusts him. You see, um, we're the same. We're just like the folks that lived in Jesus' day. We're like the folks who lived before that. We're like the folks that live between then and now. We're like the folks who'll ever be. We're all the same relative to this condition, position that we're in before God. Jesus remains the same because life is the same. Life is real. You know, as I mentioned, people haven't changed, and really life hasn't changed. Now, we've gotten some things in the last several hundred years that made, made things more convenient for us. It's much easier to make a journey now. Many of us are old enough to remember when you took a trip to town. For us, it seemed like it took all day to go there and back, and now you can be there in 10 minutes. In my hometown, and that's the way it was. We would go down to uh, from my hometown down to Winston Salem, and it seemed like it took all day. And I remember thinking about that when I used to go to the hospital when I ministered over there. I could make the same journey that it took all day to make. I used to make it in about fifteen twenty minutes. But life is still the same. It's still real. Life is still real. And here's what Jesus said about it: Matthew twenty four verses thirty seven thirty eight. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage right up to the day Noah entered the ark. Life is the same. Life goes on. And uh, it's only when these, these uh, incredible events in, life, in, in, in our, our present history, our, our, our daily lives break in that change it. I mean, it's pretty much all of us, if we go back to work tomorrow, it'll be the same tomorrow as it was when we left it on Thursday or Friday or whatever our last day was prior to, to, uh, to the break. And so we have this, this sameness about it all the time. There's, it's always, it's going to be real. Life is real because it, it is a re- repetitive thing. It, it, most days offer us exactly the same. Just a day more of it. Life is real. Life is also brief. Life is brief. Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2 says, Man born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. 
full of trouble. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm surprised sometimes that people go looking for trouble. Does that surprise you? Does it surprise you that people look for trouble? Do they not have enough that just shows up on its own? If they'll talk to me, I'll be glad to give them some of mine that just shows up on its own if they don't think they've got enough. But there are a lot of people that just go looking for it. Job said, man born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Who read that this morning in communion meditation? Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. I didn't know you were doing that this morning, Melvin. It just showed up that way, didn't it, out of 1 Peter? <laughs> James says in James chapter 14, chapter 4, verses 4, verse 14, the end of the verse, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, most of us... Uh, don't think of our lives as a mist until it starts evaporating. <laughs> Isn't that true? Those of us who are older, we, we see that our life has evaporated, so to speak. Uh, we, you know, we thought, when I was a teenager, I just thought I was going to be here forever, even though I knew there were such things as old people and some, some of them actually died, but I thought I'd be around for a while. That's not going to happen to me. That'll happen to everyone else, but not to me. And now that I'm that age... We're getting toward that age, whatever it is. I realized I was, as Fonzie would say, I was I was wrong about that. Because if we live long enough, our lives will become a mist as well. It, in, in normal living, you don't think of it like that. But all of a sudden, as the mist begins to evaporate, you realize, hey, there's not too many more particles of water dispersed in the air that's going to, to exist very much longer. Life is brief. Life is still uncertain. It's still uncertain. Just as it was uncertain years ago, just as it was uncertain yesterday, uh, it'll be uncertain tomorrow. If anything has demonstrated the uncertainty of life, certainly the pandemic has been able to do that for us in the last year and a half, hasn't it? That we have no clue what's going on. That's why Paul would write to the Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 would say, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We, we, we think our position is secure, don't we? But life is uncertain, and all the things that we're planning, all the things that we're imagining that we're going to do tomorrow or next week or sometime in the future, we just, we don't know about that for certain. But life in Christ doesn't change with every new fad that comes along. It remains the same. That's why in the same chapter of Hebrews 13, you go back a few verses, verse 5, the writer says, keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The point there is that if we start trusting in that which is so fleeting, that which we, uh, about, uh, of which we cannot hang on to, then we're going to find ourselves in a great deal of trouble. But if we hold on to that, which uh, uh, will never change or never fade away, we're going to be in good shape. Jesus is our Savior now and forever, continuously meeting all of our needs. But in the, in, in, as you wrap all this up, that, those three things there, that life is real and life is brief and life is uncertain, let me tell you, even though with all that stuff, here's, here's a good thing about it. Life is worthwhile. Bill Russell, the famous uh, uh, Boston Celtic basketball player, used to, used to say... Uh, about uh, when people would ask him about the schedule, you know, or about playing a team or something, he said, well, the, the game's on the schedule. We might as well play it. The game's on the schedule. Might as well play it. We're here. We're in this life. We're living it. We might as well make it worthwhile. It might as well count for something besides just adding up days to someone's, uh, you know, uh, uh, legacy. Life is worthwhile. And that's why Paul would say to the Colossians in chapter 3, verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, everything that we do, every, every action we take, every thought we think, we, we need to, to dedicate those actions and thoughts to the God who has created us. And so while we're here, we spend time doing three things, basically, and two of them are made put together. They're, they're, these things, it's the things that Jesus told us to do. We love and worship God, 
and we serve others. We love and worship God and serve others. Now, I'm going to tell you, if, if we can do that throughout the duration of our lives, whether it's 20 years or 50 years or 90 years, like Janice's sister hopes to celebrate tomorrow, regardless of how long it lasts, if we can do that, it will be considered a life that has been lived from a worthwhile perspective. It can't get much better than that, can it? I mean, they might not write about it in the headlines of the newspapers, but uh, we'll know that we've been faithful to what the Scripture says about it, won't we? So life rem- Jesus, excuse me, Jesus remains the same because life is the same. And one final one, very quickly. Now, I must spend a lot of time talking about this, just a couple of verses. Jesus remains the same because death is the same. Jesus remains the same because death is the same. Death, barring the return of Christ, death is inevitable to all of us. That's why the Hebrew writer says in chapter 9, verse 27, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. It's coming whether we want it to or not. Some of us have been fortunate enough to stretch our lives into multiple years. Lord gives me another six months or so, I'll be 68 years old. Now, that's not super old as I used to think it was. Okay, it gets younger every year. But I've been very fortunate to be on the planet 68 years because some people haven't been that fortunate. But whatever, whatever he gives us, know, know this, that it's coming. Death is coming. It is an inevitable thing. And know this also, that, that even though, we'll talk about the good part in a minute, even though, we think of it sometimes as, as a welcome thing. Death is our enemy. Death is our enemy. That, that's why God, uh, in Genesis 3, 3, when, when Eve is quoting that uh, verse, that, uh, those words that God said, in the day you eat of the fruit, you're going to die. You know, death is the enemy. And the only thing that fixes that is a special death. One that took place on a cross similar to the one behind me. That death fixed our deaths. Death is our enemy. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when we're taken from this life, I'm sure Satan's probably sitting around thinking, Well, I got him now. I got him now. No, you don't. No, you don't. If we belong to Jesus Christ, you don't have us because he's already fixed it. He's become the first fruits of the resurrection, and we get to experience what he experienced so that we can have eternity with him. Now, in an era of change, we search for permanence, don't we? I mean, we would really like to have some things be permanent. And so I'm, I'm always excited when I hear about people that have been married a long time. Even sometimes when they struggle through it. <laughs> it's always a good thing because there's, there's a certain amount of permanence there. And we don't get a lot of things with permanence to them. And that's why when people can stay married 50 and 60 and 70 years, my great uncle that I was mentioning earlier, if, he had lived, if his wife had lived, uh, she died the year before he did. If she'd lived two more months, they would have been married 80 years. You don't get permanence like that with a whole lot of stuff. But it's nice to have some permanence in an area, era of change. And there are, there are some things that are permanent. The faith once delivered, the Bible says in Jude chapter 1 verse 3, is a permanent thing. Doctrine doesn't change from day to day or religious leaders pass it, uh, or as religious leaders pass on because Jesus Christ is the same. It doesn't fluctuate with the seasons and the circumstances. Jesus, our Savior, is the one who was once delivered and the truth is fixed in him and his gospel is everlasting. His word is the final word to men of all ages. What a great and wonderful thing that is to know. Someone has said it like this. The same Christ who was with them, that is, the people in time past, is with you and will be with those who come after us, even to the end of the age. Yesterday was with the fathers. Today is with you or with us. And he will be with your posterity forevermore. What a, what a wonderful thing to know. Isn't it? It's just a wonderful thing to know. That the Jesus that we celebrated yesterday with all kinds of maybe earthly trappings to some extent, that same Jesus was not only Lord just yesterday, but is Lord today and will be Lord tomorrow and for all the days that will follow. 
And that means something really significant to us. That means that we can trust him with our very lives, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And if you're here today and you've never responded to the love, grace, and mercy that was demonstrated when God sent him as a tiny babe to grow into a man who would give his life on a cross, on the cross of Calvary, then we offer an invitation to you to say yes to him. But for the rest of us, those of us who, who are, are, are walking in that light just now, we, we recognize how significant it is that Jesus was who he was yesterday and today and forevermore. Let's stand and sing.